than that. Um, but I'll try and make sure the presentation is focused as much on agriculture as possible. Um, although it will creep into the biomedical sphere as well. Um, and so, yeah, these three main themes are increased openness, a reduction in the delays of publishing time, and also changes in research evaluation. Um, and so, yeah, this webinar will probably focus mostly on the organizations and the different knowledge resources that are operating in this in these areas. So first to the status quo. So this is this is true now and for a long time was pretty much only true uh, was that the only academic information that you could get from original research was the abstract, uh, which is two, three hundred words and that's, that's it, unless you were willing to pay um, 30 to $40 per paper, um, or if you were lucky enough to be associated with an institution which uh, subscribed to these, um, to these research journals. Um, so even though that's, for the most part, this is still the only way that you can access, this is the level of information that many people in, in, around the globe can can access uh, is getting a lot better. Uh, so we don't have to settle for just abstracts anymore. We can get uh, entire articles, which has been helped by the open access movement. Uh, so then you can get all the methods and results and discussions and, and conclusions. Um, but we can also go a lot further than this. Uh, and many, many publishers have started to do this, including us at F1000 Research. Uh, so other information you can get in addition to the article are the associated raw data associated with the research and also, if applicable, the associated uh, source code. Um, in fewer instances, there are some journals who also uh, expose the peer reviews uh, for research articles. Um, so I'll, go, I'll, I'll focus more on this in a little bit. Um, and then there's also um, uh, exposing of the what's known as the grey literature. So these are things which aren't necessarily peer-reviewed research articles, um, but still contain academic content. So these are things like presentations or posters that are presented at conferences. Um, so I'm going to go through all of those different components uh, one by one. So I'll start with open access. Um, so open access wasn't really a thing until uh, 2000, 2001. So what open access does is it allows uh, anybody to be able to access the research without any payment at all. There are no paywalls. Um, so this started in roughly the year 2000 uh, with the first um, open access publisher, which was Biomed Central, uh, which is focused more on the biomedical side of things. Um, and then it really started to build up steam after the Budapest Open Access Initiative in 2001. Um, so that's where lots of groups got together and um, thrashed out some uh, recommendations for the adoption of, of open access. Um, and open access has become not a dominant force, but a, a major, major force within uh, academic research publishing in the years since. Um, so after it, it built up slowly from 2001 and then it really started to get going in about 2006, 2007 when the, the very big um, open access publishing houses such as the Public Library of Science or PLOS and uh, the Frontiers uh, journals launched in, in 2006 and 2000 respectively. And uh, since then the share of open access journals compared to, uh, sorry, open access articles compared to subscription articles has increased at about 1% a year from, from 2001 to 2011. So that's roughly the last data that, that I have access to. Um, so in 2011, about 232,500 articles uh, were published over uh, open access. Um, it sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it's actually only 17%. So there was about 1.66 million uh, research articles that were published in 2011. So it's still a relatively small share of the entire uh, research publishing uh, 
ecosystem, but it is growing. And I suspect that's growing a lot faster than 1% um, from 2011 to 2016, uh, mainly because a lot of uh, major funders and organizations have started to uh, institute open access policies or mandates, which makes what well, which ensure that their researchers that they fund publish their articles open access. Uh, so just a recent example, uh, it was just announced today that the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, have reached an agreement with the journal Science for publishing uh, open access, their articles produced by their researchers open access. Uh, so Science was for a long time very uh, resistant to uh, joining in to the open access um, uh, approach to, to publishing, and, but uh, it looks like that they've come to agreement with Gates, and so that shows that even the, the biggest and most prestigious uh, research articles, uh, research journals are starting to um, embrace open access. Uh, so some of the reasons why there's a shift towards open access is, um, uh, I mean, there's, there's moral reasons, like in terms of a lot of this research is funded by taxpayers, uh, and yet taxpayers aren't allowed to access it without paying uh, exorbitant costs to uh, exorbitant fees to the publishers. Um, but there's also more practical advantages, such as this much greater reach. Um, so uh, it opens up the research to the entire general public, including uh, those working in science, but in industry or in policy, uh, which normally wouldn't be able to afford um, to access the articles within subscription journals. Um, and there's also been numerous studies that for the, for the most part, for the large most part, have shown that if you publish open access, uh, then you can get a citation advantage. So that's to say that the open access, um, an open access article is predicted to generate more citations compared to similar uh, subscription articles. And so that's what you can see in the graph on the right hand side. Uh, so this is a series of stuff. So each dot represents a study. Uh, showing that um, the, the citation advantage for publishing in open access versus non-open access journals uh, for uh, various subjects. And you can see with that with agriculture that the effect is actually one of the biggest. Uh, so you're looking at about seven times more citations. And this is and citations are the, the currency by which uh, researchers work. Uh, that's they, a lot of the uh, funding decisions and uh, promotions are based on the citations, the number of citations that they get for their, for their articles. Uh, so there's two different flavors of open access. It's green open access and gold open access. So green open access is uh, where the uh, researchers can publish or make their article openly available for free. Uh, catch there because um, most journals that use green open access insist on a embargo period where the author is not allowed to share that uh, research for a certain amount of months. So that's normally six to 12 months. In contrast, there's gold open access, which is where uh, the author, or more commonly the funder, uh, pays a fee to allow the um, author to publish the research open access immediately so people can get immediate access. Um, to the research. Uh, so these article, these are this model is funded by article processing charges, uh, which are fairly steep. They're usually in the region of about two thousand dollars. Some charge as much as six thousand dollars per article. Um, although there are many ways that authors can get uh, discounts or fee waivers. Uh, so one of the biggest one is the Research for Life, which was set up by um, the WHO and, and uh, the FAO, uh, which was originally created to allow authors in those countries to access subscription um, journals, uh, but open access publishers have sort of flipped it around so that if you're if an author is on uh, one of these lists, then they either pay nothing uh, to publish or they pay uh, a, a big discount, so roughly about fifty percent. Um, and then there are other sort of players which um, also publish academic research and do so for very very cheaply. Um, so one example is the Winnower. So they publish articles for $25, I believe. Um, so the reason why they can publish so cheaply is because they rely on a passive form of peer review. So because a lot of the expenditure of the journal goes into managing the peer review process. Um, 
was the winner word after you publish an article it, you kind of wait and allow the community to come to the article and then review it rather than the journal uh, actively trying to uh, encourage um, uh, reviewers um, so, so there are all these alternatives to allow publishing to be publishing open access to be very cheap or, or free uh, so the other big open theme is open data. Uh, so you'll see a lot of this recently with um, the recent GoDown initiative, which was uh, set up by a, by a number of uh, governments and international uh, NGOs uh, to try and advocate the, um, the release of, of big open data sets that are relevant to agriculture. Um, so what normally happens with, uh, with a regular research article is the data is, isn't provided. The raw data, the actual um, the actual numbers, aren't usually provided. It's usually an aggregate aggregate of those numbers, uh, such as a mean or median or um, something along those lines. Um, the problem is, is that nobody can end up reusing this or reanalyzing this data, which has issues. So if you want to try and reuse that data, if that data is not available, then you're going to have to uh, set up your own experiment with all the costs, financial costs and time costs involved uh, in order to try and uh, get your own data. Um, you can email the authors to try and get their raw data, but usually they're away um, at conferences or traveling or they've been sick. And so it's, it's very hard, to, it's very difficult to try and get um, data through uh, correspondence with the original author, or it can be. Um, and then there's the issue of science being very complicated. And so when you end up doing things like statistical analyses, there's usually a lot of uh, implicit assumptions that goes into that, um, and which are usually debatable. And so what happens when you can present the open data and associate it with, with the publication is that it allows others to reanalyze your data using their own assumptions or other reasonable assumptions or different statistical tests. Um, and that way they can sort of more robustly and rigorously uh, assess the, the quality of the analysis um, that that paper describes. And then there's also a citation advantage that seems to go with open data publishing. So, so we saw that with open access articles, but also with articles that are associated with open data, they tend to show about 9 to 30% uh, increase in citations. So that's, uh, that value is specifically for micro array data. Um, but it's expected that open data uh, for other, type, other types of open data could boost uh, citations to a similar degree. Um, so over the last, so it's really since 2012, a number of journals have implemented a, an open data mandate uh, where the authors who submit research papers have to submit their data alongside it. Uh, so we're one of those, um, but other major journals that have done that are people like uh, PLOS um, and, well, most journals have um, have made their data availability requirements but stronger, but in terms of actual mandates, like you have to publish the data, otherwise we, we will reject your article. Um, those are people like us and, and PLOS. Um, so the journals have been exerting this pressure, so you can see the, the data policies using this tool called Sherpa Romeo for each journal. Um, funders' mandates have also played a big part in making data uh, much more open, so these are the different major funders that have open data mandates so that the researchers that they fund have to make their data available um, either by itself or associated with a publication. Uh, so these include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the CGIAR, the uh, Department for International Development, uh, the National, National Environment Research Council and the Wellcome Trust. Um, so another thing that we're seeing is the rise of a little bit of a rise uh, for article types called data papers. Uh, so normally an article is composed of an introduction method, um, some analysis and re results, and then a discussion. 
Um, so what? But that's quite a lot of effort. And so as a way to try and encourage researchers to release their data, but still get the same credit for their data in the same way that they get credit for pub an article publication, is that you get these uh, data papers where the authors can just write up a very short introduction, methods, and then just include the raw data, and that's it. Um, so that reduces the, the amount of effort involved in order to try and um, release for researchers to release their data. Um, so a few publishers have started doing that. Uh, we're one of those, um, but others include um, the Pensoft journals as well. Uh, and then finally, so how do you find, uh, well, where is this data stored? And how do you find it as, a, as somebody who's interested in, uh, in research? Uh, so these data stored are stored in these, uh, in various repositories. There's, there's quite a few at the moment um, that archive the data and make sure that it's, it's always findable, it's always accessible. Um, although it's a lot of effort to try and go piecemeal through every single one of those uh, repositories. So you've started seeing, uh, so one of the examples of those uh, repositories that's used quite a lot in the agriculture field uh, is Dataverse, which is a repository set up by Harvard University. Um, and so the CGIAR, uh, the component uh, uh, research centers within the CGIAR all have their different uh, Dataverse um, collections where all the data that their research is produced can be found. Uh, but yes, in terms of finding, actually being able to find the data, um, so these search engines, um, these indexes have uh, started popping up where it makes it a lot easier for you just to type in your search queries and then they retrieve all, um, all the data sets that match those queries. Um, so an agricultural example of this is the CRD ring um, and a more biomedical, but also across the life sciences, uh, version is Datanet, uh, which was just launched recently, at least the beta version was launched recently, uh, by the National Institute of Health, who also uh, run PubMed, so hence Datanet. So we've also seen a move towards open peer review. Um, so at the moment, the status quo, the vast majority of journals uh, operate something called single blind review. So that's where the author's names are um, visible to the reviewers, but not vice versa. Um, and this creates some issues um, because the reviewers are anonymous, um, they can kind of get away with uh, harsher reviews or more sloppy reviews. Um, and then there's also potential for, for bias because they know that the, um, they know the names and genders and the locations of the authors, and so they might uh, project those biases about those variables into, when writing the review. Um, so there's been two different ways of trying to solve this that have been taken. So one is making the review even more close and using double blind peer review. Uh, so that's where the, neither the authors nor the reviewers know each other's names. Um, so there's some journals like the Journal of Agricultural Science do that. Uh, and then there's even more stringent um, uh, peer review in terms of blindness, which is triple blind review, where even the, the editor doesn't know the names um, of the authors either. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there's been uh, an opening up of this information to try and reduce the anonymity involved in peer review. Uh, so one example is eLife, which is a journal set up by the Wellcome Trust, Max Planck, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, which publishes the decision letter written by the editor, so you as a reader can read exactly the reason and the decision that was taken in order to accept this paper. Um, then going a little bit more about the, in terms of the referee reports themselves, um, so some are signed but not open, so that's an example of the Frontiers journals, so that's where the reviewer writes their name on the article. Um, and so you can see who reviewed the paper, but you can't see what their comments were. Uh, the alternative is um, open reports, which is exemplified by the Copernicus uh, range of journals, such as uh, atmospheric chemistry and, uh, and physics. Um, so they do the opposite, where the names are often anonymous, but the reports are visible. So you can see exactly uh, um, what their comments were. 
Uh, actually, the Copernicus journals do a quite an interesting way of peer reviewing where um, they put a, uh, an unreviewed paper out there for everybody to see, and then uh, you can see the, um, the peer review process sort of happen in real time. Um, which is what we do to a certain degree as well. I'll cover that in more detail in a second. Um, but we do both. So our reports, our referee reports, if you find, if you come into it and um, find an article on our on our website, um, you will always be able to see the reviewers' names as well as their reports. Uh, so an example of that is on the right hand side. Um, so the reason why we do this is because a lot of scholarly knowledge, a lot of uh, hard work is, got, is, is taken in order to, to write these reviews. Um, it can take at least four or five hours minimum to, to write a, a, a good a good review of a paper. And what happens in normal single blind review is that this information is basically thrown away. Nobody ever sees it except for the authors and the, uh, the editors, which seems like a big waste to us. Um, Sorry, I see that there's a bit of an echo. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so the room is a, is a bit cavernous. Um, sorry, I'll... If you have any questions about the slides, I guess if you type in, then I can answer them at the end, if there's any specific parts that you can't hear because of the echo. Um, so these reports, uh, contain very important information, such as the context, uh, the precise strengths and limitations of the article. Uh, the reviews also tend to be quite constructive because they're open and named. Uh, there's a social pressure for reviewers to be to be fair because if they're not fair, then they can be caught out uh, because their reviews are public. Um, there's also the issue of proof of peer review. So in traditional peer review, traditional articles, you don't technically know whether peer review has been done, or if it has been done, whether what the quality of that peer review was. So uh, in recent years, there's been a rise of uh, what's known as predatory publishers, uh, where they will publish any article. Uh, they say they're peer reviewed, but they don't actually peer review it. Um, but If you have the open peer review, appended to the article. Uh, then that's proof that peer review has actually been done. And then having the peer reviews open and names allows us to give recognition for peer review. Uh, peer reviewers are almost always never uh, rewarded for their work. Uh, they certainly don't get paid. Uh, they might have a chance of winning an Amazon voucher, but that's, that's usually the, the extent of it. Um, but this way, by writing their names on the reports, they can be uh, recognized in the same way as 
when they write research articles. So a certain level of academic credit can still Given to them their hard work. this just it's more general Um, there's this more general move towards trying to increase the amount of information. within papers and also try and increase the amount of types. such papers. Um, and so Quite a major issue in research publishing at the moment is this issue of publication bias Uh, a lack of reproducing 
visibility. Um, and so this comes from Places. So one is that a lot of journals put word limits. research articles and so we researchers have to Ram in as much information. And have enough room room in order to out line exactly the, the, the methodological details which which they use in order to be able to um, come to that Conclusion. So, if anybody tries to uh, replicate. Produce it. They usually don't have enough information in order to do that. Uh, this
There's also this issue where of uh, this obsession within many genders. Uh, focusing on successes or the exciting and Research, um, which is very subjective uh, evaluation. Um, and will reject perfectly sound articles just because they're not interesting or not as interesting as another article which has been submitted at the same time. Um, and then there's this issue, issue of data dredging, dredging, which comes in many different forms, but it's essentially where one of the more common ones is where researchers completely innocently um, will keep on um, uh, applying statistical tests. So if they don't necessarily get a statistical test which gives them a significant result, then they either try and use different statistical tests that try and get that same result. Or uh, they, then this is especially true for experiments that use lots of experiments, uh, that investigate lots of variables. Uh, so especially things like nutrition science is that the more variables that you compare, the more likely you're going to get a significant Results just by chance. Um, so, actually, just recently in September or, or October, the US Department of Agriculture uh, Scientific uh, Advisory Committee uh, set out a recommendation paper for their chief scientists uh, to try and uh, deal with these issues. Um, so, the first is allow researchers to publish. The results which don't show anything significant. So the ones where they do not find any significant association between two variables. Uh, or even articles that they just couldn't make work. Um, because these still have value and they um, help redress this publication bias. Because what ends up happening is that uh, research, researcher A will come up, do an experiment, uh, find a significant result. Researcher B will uh, come up, do the exact same experiment, have no results uh, just because of stati statistical chance, fluctuations in chance. And because of the incentives uh, within the sort of standard traditional publishing system, um, the researcher A will get their paper, is more likely to get their paper published because it's significant and new and exciting, whilst those who didn't find a significant result, it won't be published at all. So you as a reader, when you're looking through, you'll see lots of significant and positive results. And so you'll get a set, you, you get the impression that all these things work, uh, all these results are true. Um, but in fact, there's this publication bias because a lot of the information which is showing the opposite is never published in the first place. Um, and the way around, and the, the only way to really address that is to encourage both journals and authors to, to appreciate the value of negative results. Um, they also advised uh, push towards open data, which we've covered, as well as uh, software code as well, uh, and also just the use of uh, better statistics. So that's things like including power analyses to make sure that the, um, the sample size is appropriate. Um, uh, and correcting for multiple cor comparisons if you have lots of variables. Um, and then the final one is uh, 
put in more methodological detail. Uh, I mean, this is especially an issue for life sciences and, and, and agricultural sciences, which tend to be operating field conditions, uh, which are very variable from place to place. Um, so it's very important that the researchers uh, detail exactly what um, their experiments involved and the, and the prevailing conditions, like because all things like altitude, soil type, uh, could be some herbivores broken into the enclosure uh, at any point in time, which can then uh, influence these results and make it uh, hard to reproduce in the same experiment but in a different in a different location and context. Um, so just like data, there are repositories which uh, host things like code. Uh, the most popular one is GitHub, um, which can be paired with uh, 